Hello, now we will look at the treatment of COPD and the follow-up of that. So we gave a stable treatment to this patient or we treated the exacerbation. We have made two other videos showing how we do that. And now this third video is showing the follow-up of that. That means the patient comes for a follow-up. We need to decide if we increase the dose of the treatment or if we decrease the dose or if we continue the dose. That's the question we do deal with today. So the patient comes in and we need to do some assessment of the patient and we will check the symptoms and we ask, ask about symptoms of the patient. He will tell us about the exacerbations and so on. So this is a discussion with the patient actually. He will tell us all the facts and based on that we can do this treatment plan. Eosinophils is a, a lab test that we will do. So we will take some lab, val, val, uh, lab uh, values from the patient, so a blood sample, and then we will check the eosinophil level. And if we uh, are giving glucocorticoids, that is an inhaled glucocorticoid, that is when this is very important. So to remember this, this is an eosinophilic cell, the picture of that. The muscle stands for glucocorticoids, so steroid, and the inhale device. So when the patient is taking that, please take the eosinophil count. Smoking will be discussed. If the patient is smoking still, we need to assess the smoking habits and we need to stop that. So all the, at all visits points, you should discuss this at least five minutes with the patient to please stop smoking because that's the main cause of COPD. So smoking, Stop that, please. Comorbidities means other diseases. We need to treat other diseases. So we will have a checklist of all the other diseases that we have here. And the importance here is that we don't only focus on COPD. We have to take the patient as a global patient, as a whole, meaning we need to treat his diabetes, his blood pressure is high and so on. All the other diseases need to be checked also. Vaccination, we need to ask the patient for uh, the vaccination. Did he take it or we will give it now if he didn't and uh, therefore it's important especially if the patient is older then he will get this pneumococcal vaccine and please every year do, uh, give this influenza vaccine because the most important cause of exacerbation is lung infection as we know and lung infection is usually caused by viruses and bacteria and so on so influenza virus is coming yearly and to reduce exacerbation we need to give vaccinations inhaler te technique this is simply showing how do we use the device itself how do we use these inhalers the patient needs to know it actually some statistics show that 50 percent of patients does not know how to use it properly that means that we gave a medication which will not work because of the patient, not because of the medication itself. So it's important that the proper technique of inhaler devices are, uh, uh, are um, teached or taught. Yeah? In, into which three groups can we now divide uh, the patients? We have those with low symptoms, the patient does not complain of anything, and they have low exacerbation. Okay? Or they have high symptoms or they have low exacerbation or they have low or high symptoms, and they have high exacerbation, okay? Let's look, look at this. The definition of low symptoms just means that we have a modified medical research council grade, abbreviated as MMRC, and this is less than two. That means we, we will have low symptoms, which means they, this, this patient who has COPD can do strenuous activity, he can walk uphill, so he can walk quickly, he can exercise, he don't have any real symptoms. And this is, this is a, a point which is less than two. Everything above two, three, four, and so on, these are patients who cannot even dress up. They are getting symptoms just by dressing up. So this, is, this has to be uh, asked, what can you do as a patient? Can you dress up? Yes. Can you walk slowly? Yes. Can you walk, can you walk for a couple of minutes? Yes. Can you walk uh, uphill? Yes, and so on. You ask them stepwise, and then you find out what the level is. And the level which is less than two is strenuous activity and walking uphill, walking on stairs, for example, okay? The definition of low exacerbation is, we see this guy, he has no real complaints. He's just, he's just showing that he, he, he takes oxygen, but he don't have real exacerbation, meaning he don't get difficulty breathing, then he would really breathe hard and so on. And he he have uh, exacerbation which are less than two per year. So it means maybe once a year or not at all, once every second year. 
this is a low exacerbation group. So if we take this into consideration now, we have a guy with low symptoms, meaning he can walk uphill. He have low exacerbation, meaning he have exacerbation once a year, for example. Then we will treat this in the following way. We will see first, I, I, I wrote here A, because there is exist an ABCD classification system. And the A and B stands for low exacerbations. C and D stands for high exacerbations. The difference with, between A and B is that B have high amount of symptoms, meaning more than two modified medical research council that we talked about, meaning he can only he cannot even dress up where he can walk slowly. These are category B then. Category C and D, the difference between these are the same. So meaning C patients are can do exercise and they have uh, no problem with the symptoms, but they have but they are in the group of high exacerbation per year. Therefore, they are C and D. But the but D patients, uh, like B patients, can uh, don't cannot do so many exercises. So they can walk slowly. They can hardly dress up. So one can say that A and C are the same when we are dealing with symptoms. C, uh, B, and D are the same when when we are dealing with worse symptoms. So A and C having no or, or no or almost no symptoms, B and D having much more symptoms. But A and B have low exacerbations, C and D have high exacerbations. So it means when we're talking about low symptoms, low exacerbations, then we need to look at which is this, A, B, C or D. Low symptoms can be A or C, A or C. But because I added this, other point, which is low exacerbation, it cannot be C, because we said C is high, ex high exacerbation. This means it, it is only possible to categorize this patient as A. So we have three groups here for the follow-up treatment that we will use. Category A patients, low symptoms, low exacerbation. And this can be shown in the picture here. He can run and he don't have really symptoms. Then we have high symptoms. What can this be? High symptoms. It can be B or D. But because we added the other point, low exacerbation, it cannot be D because we said A and B are the ones which have low exacerbation. So this has to be B. Okay, so we have three groups, A, B, and now comes the third one. It can be low or high symptoms and high exacerbation. That means low or high. There's a picture showing low symptoms. He's running. And the other one uh, down there is having high symptoms. This means that this can be low symptoms mean it can be A or B. High symptoms mean it can be, uh, no, no, once again, low symptoms mean it can be A or C. High symptoms mean it can be B or D. But the point here that is saying high exacerbation, exclude A and B. That means it can only be C or D. So we have high exacerbation, it can be only C or D, and depending on the symptoms, if it's low symptoms, then it's C. If it's high symptoms, then it's D. Good. So we have three groups now. We have A, B, and then we have C or D. Okay, this will be grouped together. So what do we do now with the treatment? So the patient got the treatment in the stable, uh, stable part. So we we uh, we discussed that in an, uh, in another video. He got the treatment. Now he comes to me and in, fo in a follow up visit. What do I do with the treatment if the patient says there's no symptoms, like low symptoms, and there's low exacerbation? That means he's group A. I continue the treatment. Okay. Only thing I have to ask is that. Do you take any glucocorticoids? Then please stop that or reduce that because we don't need so much glucocorticoids if you don't have any symptoms, if you don't have any exacerbation. And please reduce that. And especially if the eosinophil count is less than 100 cells per microliter. So eosinophils are cells, white blood cells. If these are less than 100 cells per microliter, then you need to reduce or stop the glucocorticoids. If there's a patient, low symptoms, low exacerbations. So remember this, less than 100 cells per microliter. And how do you know that? You take a blood sample, okay? And then you see the arm showing glucocorticoids and then plot, 
stop, please, this glucocorticoid when the cells are less than 100 cells per microliter. What about the other uh, patient, which is high symptoms and low exacerbation? This is patient B. In this case, we will do something that is an adding, adding strategy, which means that the first thing that says here, LAMA or LABA, look at the video of stable diseases, then you will understand what LABA and LABA stands for. Long-acting muscarinic antagonist or long-acting beta agonist. Okay, this is an acronym. If you take LAMA or if you take LABA, then you add, for example, if you take LAMA, then you just add LABA, that will mean it, it will be a LAMA plus LABA together. Second point, if you take already LAMA, LABA, then you just add a, a steroid. This is in, in, inhalational glucocorticoids, okay? glucose, uh, corticosteroids, okay? E ECS. So it means that you, we are adding up, okay? We are stepping up the treatment. If you take a LABA and a glucocorticoid, then you add a LAMA. Why? So it's important that you are not allowed to add the same. We cannot say that we had a LABA glucocorticoid and then we added, add, added another LABA. That's not possible. So no two LABAs. No two LAMAs. If you have a LAMA, then you use a LABA. If you have a LABA, then you use a LAMA. Okay, always the opposite group of medication. And the fourth step here is, if you have a LAMA, LABA, and glucocorticoids, this is really stepped up now, the only thing we can do here is to add non-pharmacological treatment. Okay, anything related to exercise, diet, vaccination, stop, stop smoking, uh, pulmonary re rehabilitation, and, and so on, oxygen therapy, all the other stuff which are not really pharmacological ones, meaning not medical ones, okay? So this was when we had high symptoms and low exacerbation. That means it was group B, because high symptoms is B or D, and low exacerbation is, can only be B then, okay? What about low high symptoms and high exacerbation? This has to be C or D. In C or D, it's completely the same. As you see, this graph is the same as that one. The only difference here, which I highlighted with red, is that in B patient, we use the non-pharmacological treatment when we have already used LAMA, LABA, and corticosteroids. Here, when we have used LAMA, LABA, corticosteroids, the only thing we can add is some Antibiotics, for example, azithromycin, or another medication called roflumilast, or another step which is more severe, lung volume reduction. This is surgical stuff, lung transplant. This is really, really severe now. So the patient, why, is, why do we have to do so, such an invasive thing here? We have a patient who got the stable treatment, and now he comes for follow-up. He still have, let's say, high symptoms, he still have high exacerbations. We tried a LAMA. Then we tried the LAMA plus LABA. Then we tried the LAMA plus LABA plus glucocorticoid. And we see that it doesn't work, okay? Then we need to step up. And this patient have high symptoms and high exacerbations, meaning more than two per, per year. So we cannot just add a non medical treatment, non-pharmacological treatment, as we did in group B patients, which had very low exacerbations. Here, we will add antibiotics. If that does not work, then we go on and on and on and on and on. Okay, lung volume reduction, lung transplant. Because at this stage, we have already tried everything. We have firstly tried stop smoking, exercising, dieting. We have tried uh, rehabilitation of the patient. We have tried uh, the, the inhaler technique. Uh, uh, we have uh, given the advice on how to make that properly. We have tried everything. Oxygen therapy, the patient gets oxygen and nothing works. And we are giving triple therapy, it's called. Triple therapy with LAMA, LABA and, and glucocorticoid. There's, there's almost nothing more we can do. And then we come to the, the most, most uh, radical treatment, which is lung transplant. You take a healthy transplant, healthy lung of another patient who maybe died, not maybe, 100% died, okay? And we take that lung and put it into this patient. 
and then I ask you one, one question. If this patient is smoking, what do you think about this now? This is the same question as I have when a patient who is drinking a lot, his liver is completely wa wasted, we need to make a liver transplant. What do you think of taking a healthy liver from a healthy, per healthy person that, is, that has died, and then you put it into this alcoholic patient? Is it good or not? If you say it's good, yeah, of course it's good. We, we, we saved this patient's life, okay? That's, uh, that's fine. But, but if this patient is still continuing drinking, or in this case, if this patient is still continuing smoking, then that liver will look the same. In a couple of years, it will look completely the same. That means we could have saved another person's life because transplants are not growing, growing on trees. You cannot get transplants so easily. It, and it does, it does not matter how much money you have. You, this, these are not stuff that you can just buy like that. Of course, there are a black market in everything, but, but legally you cannot get uh, liver transplant or lung transplant just like that. That means we need to prioritize which patients do we give a lung transplant or a liver trans transplant to. And usually we will give it to persons who are not smoking or, or, or who are not drinking. They, they are uh, not destroying this beautiful organ once again. Okay? So how do we decide now if we need to increase or decrease inhaled glucocorticoids? We said that if, uh, if we see that uh, this patient is group A, meaning low symptoms, low exacerbation, then we can reduce the glucocorticoids. And we said that we can check the eosinophil count from blood. And this is a uh, picture showing a very beautiful eosinophilic cell uh, next to the red blood cells. And the level of eosinophil will predict the treatment response. So if we have a low eosinophil, low eosinophil in the blood, that means that the treatment response will also be low meaning the treatment will not be so successful with glucocorticoids if the eosinophil count is low. And the definition of low eosinophil count, as we said, was less than 100 cells per microliter. And we can predict with this eosinophil up to a level of 300 cells per microliter. Above that, we cannot really predict. So it means that we have two parameters here that we can use together that will predict if the patient will get an exacerbation. One is the history that did this patient have uh, exacerbation more than two per year? And the other point is that is the eosinophil count more than 300 cells per microliter? If it is so, if it's more than 300, then the exacerbation is more likely to happen if you stop the glucocorticoids. So once again, let this sink in. Eosinophils are more than 300. We want to stop now the glucocorticoids. If we do that, the patient will likely get another exacerbation in the future. So please don't stop it when the eosinophil count is more than 300. Therefore, I said in the group A patient, only stop, only reduce glucocorticoids when the eosinophil count is less than 100. Less than 100. Okay, so more than 300 cells, more than uh, two exacerbations per year, it's a really high indicator of getting another exacerbation in the future. So when can you not use the eosinophil count as a predictor? Disease instability, meaning the COPD is completely, completely out of charge. We don't, we don't, we don't understand what's happening here. Disease instability, systemic glucocorticoids, and acute infection. In these three cases, we can not really uh, take eosinophil count as a predictor, okay, in these, in these three cases. Okay, quick summary now. What should be included in the follow-up assessment? So patient coming in, what should I take now into consideration? Symptoms and exacerbations. I ask about the exacerbation, how many per year? What type of symptoms? Eosinophil counts if the patient is inhaling glucocorticoids. Then smoking. So please look at the comorbidities of the patient. Please ask about vaccination. Say that the patient needs to take vaccinations every year for influenza, especially. And if the patient is 65, then please add a pneumococcal vaccination. Inhaler techniques. Always uh, try to teach the patient about the inhaler, proper inhaler techniques because that's the most important thing. Otherwise, the medication will not work. And then the, we will divide the group into three groups. We have low symptoms, 
And we said that the low symptoms definition was that we have less than two symptoms. That meaning that it, he can do strenuous activity and walking up up, uh, up, up, uphill or upstairs and so on. And low exacerbation means less than two per year. And the low symptoms, low exacerbation, we group them into group A patients. So this is group A patient. High symptoms, low exacerbation is group B patients. Low high symptoms plus high exacerbation is group C or D. And then with the treatment uh, should be continued when we are dealing with patients who are group A or we reduce the glucocorticoids when the eosinophil count is less, less than 100, per, 100 cells per microliter, okay? High symptoms, low exacerbation. What do we do? This means group B. We have LAMA or LABA, then we add LAMA-LABA. When we have LAMA-LABA, then we add glucocorticoids. Uh, so glucocorticoid, when we have already glucocorticoid, lama laba that means a triple therapy, we add a non-pharmacological treatment in group B. In group uh, C, now in group C or D, we can add this antibiotics, azithromycin, or we add lung volume reduction or lung transplant, as we talked about. Otherwise, how do we decide if we need to increase or decrease the inhaled glucocorticoids? We said that we repeated many times, eosinuc count from the blood and we said it, it should be uh, a very high level of eosinophil if we want to predict uh, a, a further exacerbation. If the low, if the eosinophil count is low, then the treatment response. We cannot really treat this patient so easily if, uh, if the level is low. So uh, the best patients are uh, when they have a high eosinophil count because then glucocorticoids will work on that patient. But, but you're not allowed to stop this glucocorticoid. That's what I mean when it's high. Uh, what is the definition of, we said that's a less than 100, and we have up to which level until 300 cells per microliter is the level which can predict the further response. And these two parameters together, high exacerbations and high eosinophil count, will lead to uh, likely, uh, real likelihood of getting an exacerbation in the future. And you cannot use this eosinophil count when you have disease instability, systemic glucocorticoids, or acute infection. And I would thank you for this presentation. Please look at the other ones also, the stable disease and also the exacerbations because they are dealing with the main therapy part. Here, I just wanted to highlight what you do when you want to follow up the patients in a follow-up visit. Thank you very much for listening and have a nice day.